Welcome everyone to another episode of Kiwi Talks. My guest today is a veteran composer. You could say an OG of Rare, so to speak. He's composed for <laughs> games like Killer Instinct, Conker's Bad Fur Day, Connect Sports, and of course the recent Sea of Thieves. He is the underrated legend that is Robin Beanland. How are you doing? I'm good, thanks. How are you? Hello, everyone. <laughs> yeah, great, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> We finally so, got to do it. <laughs> yes, yes. It's taken a while to get here, but we're here. Has, yeah. I appreciate you taking the time out. I know you're a busy man, and with the crazy craziness that we're in, uh, I very much appreciate it. Yeah. Yeah, it's uh, strange times, isn't it? It is indeed. It is indeed. Yeah, yeah. So with Sea of Thieves, how much of that was recorded during the pandemic and not during the pandemic? Um, I mean, the majority was not, but I suppose we... we we worked from home from like March last year, so that would have been the um, sort of the ghost ships. Yeah, the starting of the ghost ships right. and the and the Ashen Lords. I think it's that's that was the start of work from home. Right, right. And then we did all, and then we did all this, the the uh, pirates' life. Yeah, update ah. as well. Okay, time. was that a bit of a weird transition? Um, a li- yeah, a little bit. <laughs> um. It's quite strange. I mean, it's weird, isn't it? Because I, I think um, I previously worked from home on Connect Sports, and I found that quite a different experience to now. And I don't know if that's because everybody was doing it, um, but I just needed on Connect Sports. I, I said I need to sort of just have a bit of time where I'm not getting people out sort of trying to pull me into meetings and stuff. So I worked here. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I, I suppose I just had like Messenger and the phone. Yeah. Um, Whereas now we've got this, we've got all this tech. I think tech has really sort of stepped up, hasn't it, in the pandemic? And I think, you know, things like Teams um, has been absolutely we, we, invaluable. You know, we can just talk to each other all anytime we want to, you know, a bit of a face-to-face. And it feels less isolating, I suppose. Yeah. Does it help to uh, speed things up in any way? I think it's, yeah, I think it's been okay, really. I mean, for, certainly for, for the audio, it's, um, we've kind of worked, it's been sort of fairly seamless working together and yeah and, yeah I mean, there was some initial setup but um i think it's yeah it's been really really great yeah um it's just you know it, it's it, i suppose it's, uh, for audio folks there's not a massive change is there because we're sort of used to being in rooms by ourselves and yeah, creating well, stuff that's right that's um, right so we're not it's not it wasn't a massive shift i mean it's just i suppose the the benefit of being at Red, there's just somebody down the corridor or, you know, you're at the mothership and there's there's people you just sort of bump into and have a bit of a chat with. But on the work side, I tend to sort of sit in my writing room at Rare, not dissimilar to this. So yeah, it wasn't a Basically massive Basically had tunnel vision anyway. Yeah. 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 So in regards to Sea of Thieves, was it always the plan to use some of the unorthodox instruments that you use, like the concertina, the hurdy-gurdy, the waterphone? Like was that yeah, was that right. always the intention? Did Rhea come to you and be like, "Hey, we want to use these instruments," or did you do that on your own accord? No, we no, we did that. We sort of started to just sort of research. I mean, I was basically just googling weird instruments and just um, just trying to find. I suppose it's that's it's that thing, isn't it? If you get a unusual instrument, it kind of helps give you some sort of signature to the soundtrack. So. We there's a place called Hobgoblin Music in in Birmingham, which isn't too far away. So we took a trip mm. there, and it's kind of like I suppose it's folk a folk instrument store. Um, and we sort of just looked at all the kind of weird stuff they had there, and the concertina, uh, particularly they had a massive cabinet full of concertinas. None of us play, but we just kept getting them out of the, the cabinet and playing the, the odd note and stuff. And we're just going, mm, sounds okay. It's a bit. It sounds a bit clean. It's you know this this and that and then just we just landed on this one right at the back and I think it is a student model so it's kind of a, the the buttons are a little bit more sort of cramped together but it just had this creaky that all the sort of um, the bellows were kind of a bit worn and they creaked quite a bit and it was quite raspy and wheezy and we just went that's perfect that's 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 what we're after and the guy in the shop was just like <laughs> just didn't get it at all you know but it's kind of had that character and piratey sort ofness to it. Because we do have other, we've got another concertina. We record it now and again because it's it's got a um, it's got a bigger range, so you can get sort of lower notes on it. But it still ha- it, don't know, it just has this sort of clean sound, almost like it's a, a nicely sort of sampled instrument. Hmm. Whereas the one we've got, this sort of beaten up one, just has real sort of character. And some of the the reeds don't sound that great, but when when it's in the mix with all the other stuff, 
it, it just brings a lot of sort of personality to the, to the, uh, the soundtrack, really. So did you actually play the instruments or did you get someone else to play them? Like the hoody goody no, we played them. I mean, we it's played, a weird no. instrument, the, the hoody goody yeah, yeah. yeah. Yes. I mean, it was... So that was that was an interesting one because we, when we got that, it was... Um, it wasn't it wasn't cheap um and it, it it sort of arrived at rare and i took it in the the control room and got it out and i just sort of cranked the wheel and I, the the noise i was just thinking oh no i don't know <laughs> i don't know what i'm going to do it i mean i was almost a little bit frightened by it i just thought this sounds horrendous you know i don't i don't know what i'm going to do I, I don't know if this is just a step too far but it's once i sort of kind of calmed down a bit and just played it for a bit and got to know it and sort of started to bond with it. Um, managed to get some sort of like really nice stuff out of it. But um, yeah, no, we just, yeah, play. I wouldn't say I'm sort of like any sort of virtuoso. I'm certainly not. But I can get in, do enough to sort of record a section and go, right, that's that part done. That's, that's this, you know, and just do it in bits, really. That's, what, that's how right, I did it. Right, right. Yeah, makes and, sense. And for things like the, um, the, sh the shanties, um, we, we, we've got a bass line in the shanty part and there's no, I mean, all the heard he has is a drone string. There's no, you can't change the, the, the pitch of it. That's right. But we just used, um, just used Melodyne, sort of kind of rhythmically played the part on that drone string and then used Melodyne to change it to a different ba bass note. And the same for chords, you can't play chords really. So we just sort of recorded like, you know, on a triad we'll just do the root and, you know, just, did, just re record the sort of Oh, basically, what, how I'd start was I'd, I'd sort of put, sketch the the shanty out on a piano, and then I would just split all the notes out into their own parts, and then I would just record that. I'd just listen to that part back and play it back on the hurdy. So I suppose it's like kind of like Brian May style of you know how he plays chords, where he, he sort of records each line individually. Yeah, yeah. That's kind That's of what we did for the chord parts. That would be quite uh, time consuming though, wouldn't it? Really time consuming, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's the thing with the shanties, they, they take an awful lot of time yeah. to record. It's, it's um, because it's not just, it's, there's also, we also have to do a drinking conversion as well. So oh, if somebody right. has a load of grog, you get, it does like a channel fade and it goes into a drunken version of the shanty. Ironically, ah. we, use, we use Melodyne for that. Really? To make, yeah. That's so fascinating. So so st originally sort of tried to sort of play just wrong notes and stuff, but it sounded just a little bit too abstract and it just didn't sound, just sounded a bit weird mm. really. And then started to put like the, uh, the, the sort of main melody of Ashanti into Melodyne and just started to nudge notes just a little bit out, make them a bit sour, play some wrong notes, but just nudge the tuning out. And then when that, that's against the other parts, it just sounded really, well, it sounded like, you know, when that's, the, that's the sound we want. It, I suppose it made us laugh. We found it funny. So we thought, yeah, I think we're onto something here. So, yeah. But it's weird to use auto-tune to what? put stuff out of tune. Well, <laughs> hey, if it works, it works, right? No one would even know that, right? Yeah, yeah. So was the, was the main theme the first theme that you wrote for the, the soundtrack? Yes. Yes, it was, yeah. Yeah? Yep. Um, it, it's interesting with that. The, the, the first thing I recorded for that theme was the rhythm bones. Right. Which oh, never, those are the, the little, um, what are they made sort of? Cow out ribs. Of like, yeah, cow, cow ribs. ribs. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah, it, it's, it's weird. I mean, so I, got, I thought I'm going to try and sort of learn to play the rhythm bones. So I went to my local butcher, got some cow ribs off him. Uh, and then sort of boiled them off and filed them down into kind of what looked like a, you know, from Google image, what looked like a cow rib sort of length. Um, and then I went to start to try and play, I don't have any here actually, um, just trying to play them. And it, I must have spent about three days in the studio just with like a pair of headphones on because the click was like, you know, it starts to get to you after a while. I didn't want to disturb anyone else. And I was just kind of sat rocking the, the ribs backwards and forwards. I thought, oh, that's a really nice sound. And I, I just um, fired up Pro Tools and just started to lay down a, a rhythm with the cow ribs, just like, not not how you sort of traditionally play them, just sort of clacking them backwards and forwards. And then just layered up that same rhythm to get that sort of k k k k k k k k k And that's how that tune started. 
which is weird because I never, never, I always sort of start with a melody and a bass line or something. So that's oh. how that, and then I sort of built a melody on top of that. Sorry, with the ribs, when you layered them, were you EQing them at the same time? Like the different layers? Or you just layer um, everything up? Just layer them so it sounds like a group of bones, yeah. I suppose. I suppose I, I'm just trying to think. I suppose it was just trying to do something that sounded piratey. Bones, I suppose, do. <laughs> <laughs> and then just put the melody on top of that. Kind of just started to, to noodle around with that tempo and that rhythm. And just sort of thinking of, you know, what I could put around that. But yeah, that was the first... That was the first thing I did for Sea Thieves, yeah, that theme. And what about the uh, We Shall Sail Together? Did you write the lyrics and everything for that? No, that's Chris Alcock who wrote the lyrics for that. Right. So, okay. yeah. Um, did, you yeah arrange, kind of... did you arrange the singing for it? Yes. All the singers? Yes. Yeah. yeah, so Chris did all, all the, the, the lyrics and stuff, but I did all the singers, yeah. Um, and it's, I mean, there's quite a lot of layers of vocals on there. There's Anna who sings um, the main vocal. Um, and then there's kind of, it's, it's all that sort of like, I think the audio department's on there. And then there's quite a few other groups on there. And we just wanted to kind of get this big kind of, start small and get kind of expand it into this sort of big chorus. Um, and we stuck it in three, four, just to try and make it different from Drunken Sailor. Because um, that's the, that's what it is originally, yeah. you know. So it's, um, we just, I think it was, What's the most famous shanty? Well, it's got to be that one, I think, of all of, of sea shanties. I think that's probably the most famous one, isn't it? Yeah, I think so. In in terms of international, yeah, um, attention. Yeah, I think I. So I think we thought that's, that's one the we'll go for. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we went for that one, and then uh, yeah, just tried to make a a different arrangement of it and something a little bit gritty. Uh, did you record? A, did did you record yourself at all? Singing or play, singing, playing? Or? Singing, singing. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Yourselves yeah, on there. there. Yeah, yeah. How Got how high in the mix? Um, yeah, fairly high. It's layered up with other people, but yeah, there's there's yeah, there's quite a lot of yeah, my vocals on there. The high harmony part I, I got up there. It's all those years with Grant in rock bands, you see. <laughs> one take, one take. Mm, don't know about that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but sort of just let it up and yeah, just yeah, just try to get it as sort of thick and chorusy as possible. Just start with that sort of isolated, um, I suppose, kind of quite naked vocal, and then just sort of add more parts onto it. That was that was the thinking. Start small and try and end huge. Mm. Yeah, makes sense. You've always been very very good at melody. Um, and I think it's particularly important these days because a lot of music, it kind of, it's just there, but it doesn't really stand out. But you've, you've, since your early days to now, you still seem to be very, very in touch with melody. Is that how you write? Do you write with the melody first and then build around it? Or do you start with like chords and then do the melody? How, how's, how's your composing structure like? I think it is, yeah, I think it's, it's noodling about on the piano usually. Mini mm. Grand on Pro Tools, I usually fire that up, just a, a basic piano sound and just noodle about with uh -huh. that. I think it I think it comes from the sort of the old days of not a lot of memory to do stuff. And all all we had was a, a melody. Because we couldn't we couldn't have like these big sort of lush soundscapes and stuff that would just carry on so we, we we were sort of we had to sort of build our own instruments and then i think that i mean they were okay but they're not they're not the greatest sounding you know but uh, yeah you had i suppose we just relied on melody more than we did having sort of big lush you know we couldn't we couldn't put loads of multi-track sort of parts down so we had to sort of it was midi files wasn't it and hex wasn't it hex that you were using did i you managed to skip hex but um <laughs> Good man. Yeah, I managed to dodge that. Yeah, I managed to dodge that. But, <laughs> how um, did you how did you manage that? Um I just had when I arrived at Rare, the first game was Killer Instinct, which me and Graham Norgate yeah. um wrote the music for. So that was kind of because I was thinking I'm gonna arrive I had no idea what I was gonna be doing at, in, back in nineteen ninety four. I'd come from doing T V stuff. Yeah, that's right. TV working for a, working for another composer. 
And um, I had absolutely no idea what I was going to be doing. And I just thought, I'm probably going to be just typing, you know, there won't be any sort of instruments. I'll just be typing into a, a computer keyboard. And then it's like Dave Wise said, OK, the first game you're going to work on is a game called Killer Instinct. It's an arcade game. And it's real, real audio. It was mono, but it was right. like the, the 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 arcade cabinet had four channels of audio, one for music and three for sound effects. So it was kind of carry on the way I'd be making music. It's just I had to squash it a lot more into a, a smaller space, you know. So it, it was, <laughs> but it was. I mean, it was a it was a bit of a faff. I had to sort of write sections that would could repeat quite a bit. It's almost like in a um, what was those kind of track of. Um, like programs. a loop, just constant loops. Yeah, you sort of like you'd have something. So I'd play play this for like four times, then go to this for once, go, go back to that one four times. Um, so it was kind of I, that wasn't hex, and then we were straight into the N sixty four stuff after that, which was MIDI files. Yeah, yeah. So, so yeah, it's it's you've you've done quite right, a lot. I was straight into that. Yeah, I was straight into that. Yeah. Well, you you dodged a bullet, I think. Because yeah, what I did, it sounded, did, did. It, it sounds like hex would have been hell to compose on I don't know Dave just was the master of it he just I remember him playing uh, before uh, DK had, you know was still in development I remember he, he sort of finally took me into his room because it was rare it was very secretive hmm. so we got our key to get into our bit and that was it and Dave said right I'm gonna I'll play you what I've been up to and he played me Aquatic Ambience from Donkey Kong and I was absolutely gobsmacked by the sound I just thought I couldn't believe this was a SNES I just couldn't believe it it was just incredible so he really just got under, under the hood of that stuff and really managed to squeeze everything out of it yeah it's brilliant I mean because I, I remember when I spoke to Grant a while back he got chucked in the deep end with it and he, he said that he hated it <laughs> He started after me as well, yeah. yeah. He started 18 months after me. And he got he got given the... Um, <laughs> look, I'm trying to... He got given the uh, Game Boy, yeah. Yeah. Poor, poor guy. Poor guy. <laughs> so I don't know. The... I, I, so... I managed... I, I, did, I did do a snare drum on the snares. I did... I, I started doing something. And I think that was for a Killer Instinct snares. But then Graham Norgate took that on. And I went to do KI2. So... I kind of did one thing. I didn't really program anything mm. into it. I made a sound, and I think he used it, but that was about it. A lot of people don't know this, but you wrote a theme for Killer Instinct that ended up being Funky Kong's theme in Donkey Kong Country, right? Yes. So that how was did, the very first thing I wrote at Rare. That was how the did first that thing. So it was. Um, we just. I think the team, the KI team, was they were needed to sort of give Nintendo an update. So they were capturing sort of footage of KI in its current state and they just said, can you write us some sort of dance track to go with this so we can just cut, cut to that? And that's what I wrote. And then that went to Nintendo and then E3 happened and Nintendo used that track for some DK footage promo stuff at E3. And Tim came back and said, we've got to get that track in Donkey Kong. So that's how it happened. It was pure. And you would have been like, what? Accident. Oh, okay. And Dave, Dave put it in as well, because Dave, Dave had all the skills to, to do the hex stuff. So he kind of came, I, I sort of gave him all the sounds and stuff. And then he squashed them down to, <clears throat> some of them he used some, then he had to be sort of, he created um, the track out of the, the, the sounds he already had on the snares as well. Wow. But yeah. So when you were, because when you're composing like this stuff, obviously because of the uh, technology you were using, you had to keep it down to what, a minute? Uh, under a minute? All the loops for like Killer Instinct? Do they have to be about a minute long? No, no, that I think, no. Um, smaller than that, really. Because there's only, we only had four megabytes in total for the, the entire audio for KI. Right. Um, so it was, it was, no, it was just kind of writing a tune where you could, I think we got better at it on KI2. Um, but it was, it was kind of like, you need to sort of repeat sections quite a lot. And then, so you'd, you'd have like three, maybe, maybe like three, a four bar riff, but you'd have three bars repeating. And then the fourth bar, slightly different. Things like don't have symbols that 
just go, you know, decay for forever. So cut all the decay times down and things like that, and just right. try and sort of stop things sort of because you'd have like a piece. You, you would have a a tune, and then you'd have to just chop it up, and just when you were writing, you just had to try and be mindful just to have sections that would repeat within the tune. Yeah, because I, I was wondering, because I was listening to the Killer Instinct album not too long ago, and like some of combo stuff, I imagine those are just hip-hop samples that you just looped like some hip-hop samples you found somewhere and you just meshed mm -hmm. them all together. Like what, yeah. one one second samples? Yeah, really tiny. And, just, and then th there was this um, compression routine called, what was it? Because it was the DCS sound system. I think they called it Henry. They and we sort of had to just compress the audio down in that to, and try and put it through a compressor just to, so that the waveform was kind of really a brick wall as possible so that when it went through the compression it didn't get you know if it was too dynamic it would kind of you can kind of get those birdies and things on quieter stuff so it was trying to keep everything sort of fairly loud um right. but yeah i mean it, it was okay having stuff within the track it was it was it was one mono file if you, you see what i'm saying of a tune and then you just you just try and have sections within it that would repeat so you could go well i don't need all of that i can just have that bit repeat over and then i can go to that section right so you would would you write the original track like say on the killer instant killer cuts they're like yeah. the more extended versions of the actual track that ended up in the arcade so did you write the so they, no, those th those were just w what we did for the CD. Those were those were we created for to promote the. They just said, right, we want you to we want to sort of do remixes of the tracks to promote um, the snares. Oh, so you did them after? Pack. Did you do we them did those after, after you wrote the original track? Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So the the actual in game stuff is fairly short. I mean that's an, that's interesting because one of the first things I wrote as well was the Sable Wolf tune, and I had this kind of massive pipe organ intro and this is this is what this is what i was thinking because before i kind of it, it sort of clicked that you don't have a lot of memory robin you know certainly not to these these, these and, I, and i was kind of envisaging this okay this fight's going to take place outside the castle and we'll have pipe organ there and then when you get inside it's going to go to the dun dun, 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 dun dun and all that sort of section so i wrote all this stuff and the team were like yeah it's great it's never going to fit in the game though because it's like you, you know we've got to get all the sound effects as well so that kind of got hoiked out and go okay and the arcade version of Sable Wolf just starts on the dun, 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 from that section. But yeah. then when we came to do the CD, it's like, okay, well, we can do this massive kind of intro now. And so that's, yeah, it, 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 found, a, it found a home eventually on KI Cuts. I spoke to Mick Gordon earlier in the year and we were talking about um, Cinder's theme because this was something that he wanted to know. Um, so when you wrote Cinder's theme, I know this is a long time ago, so you probably can't remember much, but the original, you know, the da -na 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 -na, was that yeah. ever supposed to be longer or is it supposed to just finish where it was? Because he always felt it, sh it it cut off and there was meant to be a second melody. Or was it kept quite um, short because of, I don't know, the length of time? I definitely had to shorten it. I think because I, 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 what was the sound? That sound was the. It was on a, a Sonic TS12, and it was like the lead, something lead guitar sound or something. I can't remember what it was called, but it had this thing on the, on the mod wheel, where you could sort of add, add in, fake, uh, feedback as as though it's kind of the amp, you know the guitar's feeding back against the amp. And I remember. I remember sort of letting that feedback sort of ring out through the track, obviously. And when we came to like in the real world of sticking it in the game, it's like, yeah, cut it, cut that note there, because you can't let it. Oh you right, so it would only it would only you could only use it for a certain period, otherwise it wouldn't really have worked. Well, it's just that note would just hang over all the next section, and it would be just you just as you as you're looking at your waveform, you're going, well, that's the memory's just getting eaten up as that note rings out. So. Anything that kind of sustained, it was like sustained didn't happen an awful lot because it was like, no, keep things short so that, you know, we can get rid of that section and, and jump to another section of short repeating things. Yeah. Same as the symbols, like, a, you know, if you have a nice crash symbol and it goes, if that's kind of, it's just your memory just disappearing in front of your eyes. So you have to go, right, short release on the, 
that's it. <laughs> you know, and that was, I think that, yeah, I think that melody did sort of ring out for a lot, a lot longer, but I don't think it had like a second section to it. Yeah. Fairly short. I think, yeah, just had to keep things short because of memory. Yeah. So would you often go back to the developers and you'd you'd basically present something to them and then they'd be like, no, no, you have to cut that down even more? No, it was down to us to do that. It's just, this is, you've got four megabytes and we need to fit, fit everything in. We need to fit all the sound effects in and the music. So we'd, we'd have, we'd sort of revisit tunes and go, right, well, that's not going to, we're just going to have to try and, we need to get some claw some more memory back from somewhere. So we'd, cut the tunes down and we'd drop the sample rate as well on sound effects mm, mm. just because it was like yeah we're not gonna be able it sounds nice at 22 kilohertz but we can't get away with that so yeah actually no that's wrong no it was no that's right it was um it was 32 point something kilohertz always and then the compression the henry compression sorted out how, how you know so we would put the value in for the compression but the sample rate was always the same going in. Yeah. It was a weird, it was a weird sample rate. And it, the reason was because the Henry compression could divide it up, I think, easier if it was at that sample rate. That's fascinating stuff though. Yeah. <laughs> but it was William's own sort of um, compression routine. Yeah. Because yeah. that, that is such a diverse uh, musical palette that you used when creating that, right? I mean, you had hip-hop tracks, you had metal tracks, you had dance tracks. Yeah. Like, was it, I mean, because usually some composers, they kind of have a s specific style, but obviously you covered pretty much every genre, I think, in that game. Yeah, um, it's, it's interesting. It was, I think it was, we wanted to sort of sound like, the, the current sort of sound of the 90s, which was a lot of that was dance tracks. Yeah. It was, it, it, there was various members on the team who some liked the dance stuff, others liked a bit of metal, you know, and then it was kind of like, okay, well, how about, you know, for, for uh, Cinder, we'll have a bit of metal for that. And then, you know, for Orchid, well, right, we'll have something sort of like, uh, I'm trying to think of the, the you know, the, band, the bands at the time and stuff they're just like it was the, the sort of 90s dance music was starting to sort of like get fairly big in the UK so we thought well, we want to sort of, sort of sound current like that so that's what we emulated but um, and then I suppose things like Sable Wolf is kind of probably my more my kind of thing sort of soundtrack stuff the same with Rip Tour as well um, yeah I don't know it was quite a mixed bag wasn't it and then Graham was kind of really into his kind of industrial stuff as well. So he was like, he liked bands like Front 242 and things like that. So he was right. like, th things like uh, uh, Glacius and Fulgore had a quite an industrial sound to them. Because that must Certainly be incredibly Fulgore difficult to do. Because when, most most games when you work on a score, it's usually, like even with um, Sea of Thieves, it kind of has a specific musical palette. It fits yeah. it, right? More like the Irish yeah. kind of Celtic type sound. Yeah. But Killer Instinct's not like that at all. No, but I suppose it is it I suppose you you kinda get away with it a little bit more because all the characters are quite different from each, aren't they? And yeah, the, well, and that's the stages right. that they're the stages that they're in, you sort of could go, Well, this is kind of we can we can sort of make this sound like this and Yeah. It's, you wouldn't get away with that in Sea of Thieves because it's all kind of of one universe, isn't it? But yeah, of I course. Suppose the, I suppose the stages are all quite different in Killer Instinct, so you could kind of lean into it a little bit more, I suppose. Yeah. But, it, would you, but would a lot you... of it was kind of like people going, I like dance music, can you do a dance track? I like metal <laughs> music, can you do a bit of metal? There was a lot of that going on as well. Yeah, right, right. <laughs> <laughs> so it's as simple as that, just people we... all chiming in. All the yeah, developers chiming going, oh, in. I like this sort of music, can we have something like that? I think something like this is really fit, and they'd kind of, you know, Make their make their argument for yeah it needs to be a bit more sort of chug and a bit of metal and sort of stuff like that so we go okay we'll do something like yeah. that. Yeah. Would you want to do a fighting game again or are you kind of like ah oh, I'm over that stuff and more more what you're doing now? Never say never I suppose but I, I just kind of like to sort of keep looking forward. I suppose if it was something, do you know what I mean? Yeah, I kind of sort of 
like to sort of think about you know where, where we're going to sort of take stuff next um but never say never i don't yeah i don't know it depends on the fighting game really i suppose yeah i always, I, I always sort of think with fighting games i know i know it's I just want to go and kind of go and explore the background a bit more. I want the character to sort of like just walk off and let's go explore over there a bit, you know, and yeah, have a bit yeah. more of an adventure sort of, and then a bit of fighting. Yeah. And I suppose even with fighting games, the tricks would still be short anyway, even with the, the amount of technology and not being limited by hardware anymore, you'd still have to keep it condensed to what? A because two, the rounds are sort of, yeah. Yeah. Two minute track and, and stuff. Yeah. Yeah. I know, um, because you gave um debt tapes and stuff to Mick Gordon when he was working on Killer Instinct. I did, yeah. 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 Did you give any advice to him, or I know you've called him like the what you've you you call him the Walter White of video game composing, which I find hilarious. It's a good <laughs> it's a good analogy. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's, um, no, I didn't give him any advice. He's you know he didn't need any advice from me at all. But uh, no. Uh, no, I just I just said you might find some of this stuff useful, if you know, um. And there's, I think I just got all the data. I still got all the dats at Rare HQ, uh, and I just they still worked. So I just ran. I just got a Pro Tools session up and just just printed them all off for him. So oh, that wow. might be something useful here. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I'm I'm sure he appreciated it. Because how 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 was the um, culture changed from the time in the '90s, right, when you're working on Killer Instinct to now Sea of Thieves at Rare? Is the culture very much the same? It's all, yeah. I mean, the, the, the certain aspects, yeah. I think, it, I think certainly just being creative, just go and create and, and be creative, and just want, we want you to be creative and create really nice stuff, and don't worry about all that business. You just create, and that's kind of what Rare was back then as well. Hmm. Um, and I'm, I suppose we were very fortunate that we were in house because I suppose that was really unheard of. And to a certain extent, it might even be now, really, to have a whole sort of in-house music department. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? It's um, and there was there was me, Graham, Dave, and Evelyn when I first started. And then Grant joined, uh, and then Dave Clinic, Alistair, Ben Cullum. Uh, John Silk, Jamie, Steve, we had quite, do you know what I mean? We, we got and everybody, most people, musicians who also did sound effects as well. And I think we were just really fortunate that, that that sort of investment was made early on. And it was a bit kind of thrown together to start with. I remember the Fikur Instincts we had, we didn't have a vocal booth, we just had Wash In Line and Army and Navy Blankets outside my office. Because it was, my office is not dissimilar to this one, so it was, it was pretty live, but at the end, we just hung a, a load of sort of washing line up and put some heavy blankets up, and that was a vocal booth, and that was for Killer Instinct 1 and 2. So we went, we didn't have like a professional recording studio that we'd, we went into. I mean, we'd, we, later on, we've obviously, we've got that now. Uh, but it was really sort of taken seriously. Music and audio was taken seriously. Um, in fact, Chris Stamper said it's 50% of the experience on numerous occasions he'd say that so and I think really really fortunate that we were and still are we get to just kind of go off and explore just go and explore and do stuff and like things like you know I'd like to get a hurdy hurdy no problem okay we'll, we'll, we'll sort that out you know and, it, and it's just being able to sort of go and and then it's not just about the writing of the music either you know I'm really really fortunate things like the shanties in Sea of Thieves John Vincent, who's the audio director at Rare, he taught himself how to code. And he, he's responsible for a big part of the shanty system in Sea of Thieves. So that's the, the, the sort of where you play your hurdy-gurdy and you're playing the melody. Somebody else plays a concertina. Well, they'll, they'll play the backing. They won't play the melody. But if you, drop, if you stop playing, they will take over the melody. And that's all in five, one, and they're wandering around and all that. So, so he wrote all the code to make that work. So I'm really fortunate that if I have any sort of ideas of how we want to make the music sort of interact and do stuff, I can go to John and say, thinking of this, what do you think? And he said, you know, a lot of times we'll go, let, let, let me, yeah, leave it with him, let me think about it and we'll, we'll work out how we can do it. Um, so that's really, I think we're really fortunate as well that we have that, do you know what I mean? Because it's yeah. not a case of, we'll hire you, write some tunes, 
okay, thanks, you know, and, it, and you sort of kind of get a level tune that plays relentlessly and just loops around. We're sort of, especially now, we're trying to, it's it's an interactive medium, isn't it? So That's right. We're just trying to get, it's not, I know a lot of folks are kind of going, look, we're just like the movies now. And it's not, it's not a linear format. It's a, you know, the player's very much in con- charge of what they're going to go and do. I'm going to go over here now. So it's trying to sort of create those pockets of music and audio that can just be served up when the, when the player chooses to do that. So I think just really fortunate that it's, we've got that in, in that, that investment of being in house and also having the support of software to implement stuff and bring your ideas to life. And I suppose what you you form quite intimate relationships with a lot of your team. Yeah. 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 And that's not necessarily the case always in the gaming industry. Particularly if you're um just delegating to third parties. Yeah, it's because it's harder to do that sort of stuff. I mean, I just don't know how he would do some of the stuff we've done in Sea of Thieves without being in house and without John sort of being two doors two doors down from me. And we can go I mean, even now we sort of get on teams together and we he shares his screen okay this is what I've got and we get he gets wise up and and stuff like that and it's yeah I'm not sure how easy that would be I don't know but it's, mm. I think we have the luxury of time to be able to sort of explore that stuff and and try and create some sort of new experience audio music sort of experience with you know what we're trying to do in see how, how how long does it actually take to explore the kind of musical palette that you're trying to form, whether it's for Sea of Thieves or Connect Sports. Hmm. Does it take, <laughs> is that a long process for you? Sometimes, or, I mean, that's, yeah. I, I tend to sort of pontificate a fair bit on the keyboard and mess around with stuff and, and noodle and stop and faff about. I think I do probably, uh, you know. Well, for how long are we, are we talking weeks are we talking days sometimes I can do I mean sometimes things will just fall into my lap yeah. you know songs but I think I've, uh, certainly that initial period of trying to find the palette and the and what's what's the sound for this I can yeah I can get into quite a lot of detail and, and messing around with stuff mm. I've got loads of instruments in here that I'm just you know behind me as well um, yeah I don't I even know really... what some of those are I can't even I can't really play them, but it's just, yeah. it's, it's, it's for me, it's, it, it's getting into a, sitting with an instrument that's kind of alien to me and then just hit, putting, re, hit and record and then just noodling about and seeing what I come up with because it's, that's when you sort of land on those kind of happy accidents. And if you, you sort of go through the session afterwards and when you, when you're not in that sort of process of like when I'm sat at a keyboard and somewhere I'm sort of used to, mm. you kind of find those little nuggets that you can go, ooh, what's that? When you, you because you weren't aware that you actually did it. Do you know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I definitely yeah. understand what you're saying. I think I got that idea from Keyboard Magazine years ago. There was a an interview with a um, Patrick Leonard, who I think is a Madonna songwriter, and he he said one of his tips was he would just have a tape recorder, and he'd put it in record and record just just um, improvise for like ten minutes a day, stop, and then come back the next day and do some more and then he would listen to the tape back like a few weeks later and just hear things where he was in a different sort of mind I suppose he would just pick up on different kind of ideas that he would if he's specifically trying to write something he would never have come up with but because he was just kind of noodling about and improvising there's sort of like little nuggets that he could develop into the ideas and I tend, I tend to do that quite a lot Sometimes I will sit at the keyboard, but certainly things with like the weird instruments and stuff. It's just kind of exploring and experimenting. So I can take some time doing that sometimes. So do you, do you ever get points where you're just so in your musical zone that you can be there for hours and hours and you just refuse to leave the studio because you're kind sometimes. of in the middle in the middle of you know what uh, a, a a moment that can never be replicated. Yeah, sometimes yes, definitely. Yeah, yeah. and it's uh, that's um, that's come more evident since working from home as well because the house is just there. So I'll just I'll just stay I'll just stay a little bit longer. Sometimes get into trouble for that. <laughs> but um, but that's creatives though, right? That's it. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's when those sort of moments happen. I mean, sometimes it's, it is 
it's, it can be sort of very workmanlike, and it's like we need we need music for this, we need something for this, something for this. But when you when you kind of trying to explore what the sound of this game is going to be, I think that's always a fun time to sort of just play and trying to get in that um, frame of mind of just playing. There's a mm. really good John Cleese. Um, talk about creativity and he's, he says a, a, a sort of similar thing of just you've got to allow yourself time to play and you've got to, you've got to set, aside, set aside time to go and do that and just no phones no email just all that stuff's put away and you just give yourself like a couple of hours just to sit and ponder and I mean I suppose he's talking about writing as well like but um, it's probably in regards to any creative outlet I guess where you've just got to allow your mind to I'll just do this first I'll just do that first and it's like when you, when you're sort of in that frame of mind I don't think you ever come up with anything whereas if you just kind of shut the doors and just ponder and noodle about and do stuff that's when I think that's when the sort of exciting stuff happens I've actually spoken to a lot of composers that say they find it hard to finish anything if they 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 don't have a deadline Yeah is yeah is that the same for you so, yeah, I think so. I, I mean, th there's a famous saying, isn't there? Nothing's art's never finished; it's just abandoned. I think that's quite true. <laughs> yeah, that is quite true. I've heard Peter Jackson use that same saying. Yeah. Yeah, yeah just yeah. like yeah, that'll do. <laughs> I can't face anymore. I can't, I'm just sick of it. No, yeah. Well, I suppose it's better than um, getting tired of your creation anyway, because you're just so over yeah. it that you've worked on it for so long. Hmm. Yeah. I think that. that I mean, I. The thing, the thing to do is just what, just go on to something else, which I try to do. And sometimes I don't. Sometimes I will work at something and keep at it. But it, often it can just help just to kind of go right. Let's stop working on that for the moment and go on to another track and just for, you know come back to that with fresh ears. I always find that um, the first listen of the day is always really valuable. I always find that whenever I'm working on anything, when I come back to the studio the next morning that first kind of just play through and you know I've got my, got my, my post-it notes in my pen and that, that kind of just make notes on stuff on that first listen because you, the day before you're kind of just so engrossed in it you, you miss stuff but then and it's also probably because your ears get tired as well so yeah yeah so I suppose when you go back and listen to it you can yeah. li listen to it and be like oh that's terrible or oh this is good yeah yeah it's vital stuff Yes, definitely. It's really important that 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 first listen. I really think it is. I did it yesterday, and I've, I'd, 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 I was going to do a, a a bounce on Friday at the end of the day. I thought, now I'm going to leave it till Monday. Have a listen through, and it's uh, there's quite a few changes I made just because it was fresh ears. Is so it? I think, yeah, taking yeah. taking breaks very important as well. Yes, as much as it is kind of easy to just get engrossed into it is. Just to actually have a break from it all and just go for a walk or go on the bike or something. So do you have set breaks? Do you have like, I'm going to go for a break at this time or are you just kind of wing Lunch, it? Lunch, that's about it. Yeah. Mm. I see that you always, you, you like your lollies and your chocolate. What is it, random lollies and the chocolate that you eat? The randoms. That, the, the randoms were, the, um, <laughs> that was from the, the bike ride. So yeah. that was just it. The, the Land's End to John O'Groat's bike ride was, they... You'd have like three stops a day on the bike ride. You'd, you're averaging about 108 miles a day, and you'd have two sort of pit stops within that. And usually they, they have things like pork pies, but they always have bags of randoms and this other stuff called trail mix. Right. And I just got I, I kind of got addicted to that on the ride, <laughs> and it was quite a hard habit habit to hit, kick when I got back from the ride. So I was like, sat in here eating a bag of randoms. It's like, hang on a minute, Robin, you're not actually doing anything to burn this off you know yeah. you just sat here <laughs> just sat there do you just, do you so, just, eat, just eat them and not even aware that you're eating the whole packet as I know yeah. yeah it's quite easy to do yeah they're addictive <laughs> that was like my little treat on the on the ride when I did the bike ride it was um, yeah it's like around sort of 2pm like I'm going to have a bag of randoms now it's my little treat while I'm cycling along <laughs> oh that's awesome oh do you ever think of melodies while you're uh, cycling? Yes. Uh, the, uh, the lyrics to Grog Males came to me 
while cycling. Oh, really? And the melody, I think, for that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, sometimes. Uh, yeah. It doesn't ah. happen a lot, really, but sometimes they do. Uh, so, if you're cycling... I usually have my phone handy. I usually have my ha- phone handy and just yeah, record a... I was going to ask. <clears> just to if... record a video or something like that. Hmm. Because otherwise um, you'd forget it. Yeah, always do. I mean, something else would come along, I think, but it's nice to just sort of capture a melody or something. I'm just... I've got lots of like um, audio notes on here of just me humming and some you go back to and go, I don't know, I don't know what I was thinking. I don't, know what that, I don't know what that is, but sometimes you get something. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I mean, Be Calmed is another track from Sea of Thieves, which is quite popular. And that, right. I think I, was, I did that on my iPad on um, GarageBand, I think, originally. Just a, a melody that came to me for that. And then that kind of got expanded into the, the full track. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, is there any genre that you haven't really worked in or a type of game that you haven't done that you'd like to do at this point? You've done a lot of different stuff, so... Hmm. I don't know, really. I don't know. I always used to think I'd really like to do... As a massive Carl Stalling fan, the guy who sort of scored all the Looney Tunes stuff. Yeah, yeah. And I tried to do a little bit of that in Conquer, I think. Um, but I always thought something... Would it be possible to create... Because that, that, the music was so in sync with what was going on on screen. And I always used to think, I wonder if it would be possible to create a game like that where it's kind of... It's, it's, it's run... Depending on what the player does with the character... You score it exactly for that animation or whatever, but I think you'd need you'd have to have such a sort of a hatful of variations on the same animation just so that it didn't get tiresome or you know repetitive. But I always used to think something would it be possible to do something like a Carl Stalling? I always felt that those cartoons were so much sort of um, love poured into them, and so much sort of work and detail there. Uh, something like that would be, but that's just that's just me. I don't know how popular it would be. <laughs> oh, well, I'm sure I'm sure they could create something like that. Surely, yeah, you could do it. But I always used to, I used to, always used to think. I suppose Cuphead's come pretty close to it, hasn't it? Actually, thinking about it, yeah, Cuphead's yeah. that kind of that kind of thing. You could always pitch it to the designers at Rare. <laughs> be like, make something like this so I can compose to it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. But no, it's um, it's nice to sort of just sort of get inspired by the team really I mean that's the thing about Rare I think for me is um, it's a people thing and it's the people who you work with who you constantly for me I'm always constantly inspired by and the artists Mm. and the design and the um, and the software it's just like you feel like I really need to sort of be on my game here because you know they're so creative and amazing and they inspire you so much well, hey, like you're pretty good as well. I mean, you play all these unorthodox <laughs> instruments that are so weird that people haven't even heard of. I mean, what what um, you can obviously play piano, you can play trumpet. Other, I mean, trumpet is my main instrument. Um, yeah. uh, piano, kind of noodle about on. Um, but yeah, yeah, trumpet. I don't know, just trumpet. I think it's it's that thing of isn't it? Just being able to this amazing life of, of having a door here I mean that's the other thing isn't it now it's it's just so accessible for people to make music whereas you used to have to go and record in the studio and stuff and pay an hourly rate now it's just like I can do it all on a desktop and I can really lose myself doing it and explore and I think it yeah it's just so fortunate to be able to do that and to, to get these I'd like to try this weird instrument out and then get it and just record it and put it through effects and stuff and do weird stuff with it. I just it's lovely. Just I love it. Cause how how just prominent is, is that in a lot of the music that you do? Like do you stick it through a synthesizer or put uh, a lot of different effects? Like with with uh Sea of Thieves you kept a lot of the original stuff besides from auto tune type things, didn't you? Yeah, I mean it's it's yeah, we see a thesis. There's some stuff that's kind of a bit weird and 
Um, but yeah, I suppose it's, tr- it's Sea of Thieves is more about trying to keep it um, piratey is the main thing. Just mm. rough, around, rough around the edges and piratey. Like the hurdy gurdy is quite scratchy and clackety and all that sort of stuff. And, those, and recording all that sort of stuff, it's kind of just getting getting those kind of um, those detail that sort of detail in there. Um, and I suppose there is some stuff. Yeah, like I suppose, yeah. A good example is the water phone. Mm. I used that quite a lot, and I've used I've then taken water phone sessions that I've recorded because the thing with the water phone is like it's very hard to predict what you're going to get out of it. So it's just put in put in record and then just record and do experiment and do different things with it. Um, but I used um, Paul Stretch on that, which was gave some really incredible beds and textures. Just getting that water firm because I suppose it's such a rich instrument. Putting through that pole stretch and just putting a massive time stretch on it got some really nice stuff. And almost you can sort of almost hear melodies within those textures. It's weird. Um, it's, a, it's a fascinating instrument. It looks like a bird cage or something. It just it's really weird. The look of it. it yeah, it's two trays actually. It's soldered together with like tines soldered onto them at different lengths, and then it's just you just fill it with water and. Is that how it works? Yeah. 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 So would 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 you want to get your hands on uh, any type of Japanese or Chinese or Greek instruments to use in some sort of score? Um. Obviously, if you're working on it, yeah. If you're working on a game that fit. Yeah, but uh, for me, it's kind of. trying to think there's a couple that i've got rare now uh, but it's it's kind of taking an instrument and playing it how it's not expected to be to be played so um just like retuning it and things like that um and then creating the textures and effects i mean the herd is a good example of that of just recording drones and things like that and then and then adding layering them up and putting through through effects so it's anything a bit odd i quite like Mm. any kind of instruments and stuff are, that are a bit strange um, and I think it's it, again it's that thing of when it's alien to you and it's not something that you play you, you like when, when I'm at the keyboard or piano it, you tend to sort of go through the same sort of shapes and things whereas if it's I just pan the camera down here look I've got this thing here called a what's it a harpeggi ah oh, yes yep um that's completely i mean it's kind of good for keyboard players because it is kind of laid out like that but it's just because you kind of get into different shapes and things on there and experiment with it it's just you just kind of get new inspiring melodies i think and textures that take you off on a different path um Mm. is that the question what was the question (laughs) is that the question no, you answered I mean, you you answered the question, yeah. Yeah. The, <laughs> the, of, the other thing I use a lot is um Spitfire stuff. I use a lot of the Spitfire orchestra right. stuff. I think that their stuff is really nice. It's really interesting sort of sounds as well. I mean they're sort of doing different stuff with theirs. Their libraries. It's not just a case of there are really nice string samples and things, but there's some of their sort of more recent stuff where they kinda of do trying to do different things with the instruments and again it's kind of they get that sort of detail and where it's just on the edge of silence and yeah. you get these incredible textures that and I think the the thing with that for me again it's it just takes, it inspires you mm. it takes you off somewhere different sort of creatively so how do you keep your finger on the pulse in terms of all the evolution of musical technology i mean cuz you're probably so busy writing and then you're doing your 750 mile bike rides. 960. 960. Oh, okay. Apologies. 960. <laughs> Going to make sure I get that right. Um, um, how do you find the time to do all this? I suppose there's, there's accounts I follow on Twitter where I'm trying to keep keep on keep up on various um, bits of tech and things. Um, I try not to get the, the thing is that. that and I suppose it's sort of any advice I'd give is, not, is I'd try not to get sort of too wound up in this door or that door or things like that, do you know? Because there's times where I, I think, how do I do that? And I go do have a quick Google and 
inevitably get on some sort of forum where it turns into ah oh, that's you don't want to be using that you don't you want to be using uh, Reaper not uh, Pro Tools or you don't want to be you know it's all that sort of stuff and it's that kind of I just think I just try not to get wound up in any of that stuff because it's I just think just go and create it doesn't matter what you're using just find something that works for you and then the the, the main thing is just to be creating and just try and do that don't get too wound up in the amount of bling you've got on the screen you know like all the plugs and stuff like that just turn away and look don't don't look at the screen and just listen because i think you can get a bit sort of caught up caught up in it all well there's no template is there to composing no yeah so it's whatever and method do, works yeah yeah and do stuff off as a grid actually as well lose the click and just just do stuff on on the grid because it's easy enough to move stuff around and, and make it make it fit is that my phone sorry yeah yeah um do you know what i mean it's you don't always need to just have stuff i mean obviously if you work into picture and things then you do but if it, sometimes it's just nice to not have a click dictating tempo and just just uh record and and then slide stuff around and make it fit as if you're working on tape i suppose so do you actually oversee the actual Im implementation of how um, some track is going to be implemented? Or do you just hand that over to someone else and they implement it in the scene that it needs to be in? Or um, do you actually usually, have some oversight in regards to that? Just usually get something... I mean, with Sea of Thieves, I suppose, a lot of the music is... N there's not really a... Uh, th th there's not really a uh, this piece of music starts here and ends here and then just loops around it's kind of broken into bits so you'll have like an area of the map and there'll be um there'll be like a hurdy-gurdy and a nickel harper playing some playing some melodies and things like that and then there's some chords um and other bits and bobs and like steel drums and things like that but i, I tend to sort of what well, what I did with Sea of Thieves is I just sort of get those melodies and cut them out, not have a not have a a piece of music as such, just cut them out, and then we'd put them into wires and get them to randomly trigger. So it always feels like something's just kind of blowing on the wind, and it's you're getting that randomness. So you you're not firing up a level, and that piece of music always starts. And you, you as a do you know I mean as a play you, you don't get that kind of constant repetition of like oh it's this piece of music again because I think it doesn't matter how great the piece of music is it gets tiresome after a while doesn't it if it's just if it's the same thing if you're going through the same sort of repetition so trying to avoid that um, so what I tend to do is just kind of record stuff and break it out into bits and then talk to John Vincent who's the audio director who when we'll sort of implement it he'll I'll say this is what I'm sort of thinking and he'll he'll make sort of suggestions on how to do it and, and we usually sort of He'll he'll take the bits and put them into wise, and then he'll we'll get, we'll get on a call together, and he'll sort of share his screen, and we'll go through it and play around with the sort of trigger times and things like that, because it's not always we'll sort of I'll trigger it between thirty and seventy seconds, and randomly pick from about ten different things that you can play, and then with sort of things like you see know what I'm saying, and then. We'll go, okay, we're on this, this chord progression here, or this chord here, so you can pick from these nine melodies. We're on this chord here, you can pick from these nine melodies. We're on this chord here. So it's kind of... And that's the thing I really like about working like that, is the, the music has a life beyond me after it's left Pro Tools. Once I've, I've given it up to John, it's kind of doing its own thing. And it's you, you don't, you, you're not starting up a level and that same piece of music starts and triggers at that point. It's kind of, it's kind of just pockets of music around the world that can fire up. And if the player decides to play a shanty, then that'll fade away and that that'll take over. So it's kind is of. That a, is that actually a longer process than the composing process? Probably. <laughs> yeah, it yeah. sounds like it would be. Yeah, I think it is, and I think that's again that the thing that goes back to what I was saying about being in house. I'm very fortunate that I'm afforded the time and resources to do that sort of thing the fact that there's somebody there's john is there to sort of help me uh, realize it um 
yeah really really fortunate yeah to, yeah to be able to do that and explore and try stuff and sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't sometimes you sort of go mm, it's not really working and go back to the go back to the drawing board. an example yeah there's there was i think there was something with the, we have like the skellies in sea of thieves and i was i was trying to do something when you sort of caught into proximity of those and it it didn't work so we went back to the drawing board on that but yeah that's that's the development for you it's kind of iteration is king isn't it try it to, to, to just to be able to get and try this stuff out and is, fail is, and fail fast as they say is there a little part of you <laughs> is there a little part of you that kind of hurts inside though when it gets rejected when a piece of music gets no. rejected no? no that's good because a lot of cre you know how a lot of creatives are quite sensitive people uh, I mean, maybe maybe years in the early years maybe but um sorry just take that off there um no not now just go fair enough fair enough no, and then no go back to the drawing board yeah i mean yeah. there must have been so much stuff over the years that ended up on the cutting room floor with sea of thieves and killer instinct and conquer's bad fur day i mean how much, stuff, I mean, how much stuff how much did you write that never made the cut well i don't know sometimes it just finds a home somewhere there was a there was a tune in because uh, before conquer was bad fur day it was 12 tiles wasn't it mm. and there was um there was kind of like this Colise coliseum arena and I had this sort of well, that was that turned out to be the Jet Force Gemini main theme. So, ah, but that was never the intent. Wow, it wasn't that. No, it was just I just pulled it around a bit and thought, well, that that melody works. I could just make it sound a bit more space space opera. And <laughs> yeah, yeah. So do you, so do you, was, yeah, okay. Oh. So you get some some stuff will find. It. I mean, some stuff hasn't hasn't found a home, but you, you kind of you just kind of pop it in a folder somewhere, and then you know maybe come back to it. At some yeah. Point. So, so do you still have stuff in your vault from decades ago that you ever go back and revisit and think about using for something? I'll go and have a listen, but I don't. I'll, I'll probably just go. Oh, just do something new now. Yeah, because it's kind of old older sounds and things, and you can. I mean, maybe I don't know. I could maybe with some sort of newer, nicer sounding stuff, maybe. But yeah, maybe, yeah. Maybe if you're doing a retro game, it might work, possibly. But yeah, yeah. But I suppose that's creatives, right? You're always looking to the new thing, as opposed to looking to the past. Certainly, yeah. I prefer to do that. I mean, I suppose it's that's kind of one of my sort of. Uh, influences is miles davis or one of in terms of like that's the way he kind of approached stuff mm. i suppose that's because i was a trumpet player i mean it doesn't i don't think his music has any uh, influence on what what i write but i think he's kind of his philosophy was always just kind of i've done that now let's go move to the next thing and not you know kind of blue is like one of his biggest albums i don't think he's ever left the chart and he could have just stayed and on that and just played just kept sort of touring that I suppose but he didn't he went that's done I'm moving on to this now and sometimes it's successful and sometimes it isn't I suppose in terms of his, it's, I suppose it was always a success for him because he was moving on but he, yeah. but he pioneered different um, genres of jazz and stuff and I think I'm not saying I'm doing that but uh, it's just I suppose that's kind of been an influence to me it's just that, that sort of philosophy of always just kind of looking forward and not looking back and stuff I think you can give yourself some credit. Come on. I mean, see if these got nominated for awards, you know. And Killer Instinct and Flu Influence. I mean, Mick Gordon was heavily influenced by Killer Instinct. So, come on. You can take some credit. <laughs> his sound is amazing. I have to say, his, his, the, his sound is incredible. The sound he gets. Amazing. Yeah, yeah. He's he's very good at mixing. That's... Yeah, incredible. And, and I love his um, Sabre Wolf theme. I did. I love that. Oh yeah, it's brilliant. The first and he included, and he play, played a homage to you at the end of it, which is great, to your original theme. Which but I it sounded so just those players sounding. It just sounded so unhinged, and I thought, God, that's amazing. So it must have been so pleased when he came up with that. Yeah, yeah. Well, you you can take credit for some of that. <laughs> <laughs> just say, oh, you know, he got that from me. He was influenced by my melody. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Uh, oh well um i'll wrap up there this has been great robin thank you so much for chatting it's been a long time That's, coming you're welcome. 
sorry it's taken so long it's been a, a yeah busy old time of course the, my, my dog got uh, yeah yeah how is we, your we dog she's fine yeah she is yeah. Her, her, her ear is healing up nicely now so uh, okay yeah but That's yeah good. we almost had it didn't we? yeah we, almost, yeah. we were almost booked in weren't we were on the verge and then yeah. yeah and then something happened but hey these these things happen it's it's life so um if anyone wants to follow you and keep up to date with all your work what's the best way of doing that um i suppose i i, I kind of tweet stuff quite a lot um at the real beano on twitter is probably a good place to follow me i don't I, facebook a little bit not re- not an awful lot mm, mm. and i'll generally sort of share stuff that would we're doing it rare but there's there'll be an awful lot of pictures of my dog on there and me sat with a beer by a uh, a wood burner usually yeah um final question before you go like yeah. did you actually ever get to me do you actually have any interaction with the execs at microsoft or nintendo at all or do they kind of keep you off like because you're like the golden goose so they try and block you off from no, that we always, stuff now we, no, we talk to them all the time yeah oh, okay well that's good and was that the same with nintendo i mean did you ever meet <clears> any <throat> of the the big guys like shigeru miyamoto or any of them mm-hmm. so, met him a few times oh yeah he came to came, yeah, come to around visit quite a lot. Wow! I'm trying to think of what he said to me. He said, uh, "Do you play all these instruments?" That's what he said to me. And you were like, "Yes, yes, I do." <laughs> uh, I, I, I said some of them because Tim Stamper had put he, he was storing his guitars and his sax. I didn't play saxophone. Um, he was storing you know, storing those in my room. And, and Mr. Meme, I said, uh, "Do you do you play all of these?" I said some of them. <laughs> um, oh. Yeah, but no, we always always sort of interact with uh, with everybody, all the execs. Phil Spencer comes along over quite a lot. And... Is there an element that's intimidating when those guys are like behind you watching what you're doing? No, no, no they're just really down to earth and just down to no, earth because it's all yeah, they really are down to earth and just it's all about creation, creativity, and the games. Games are king. Game is king. I actually find that because I've spoken to musicians and actors, and I find a lot of the the gaming industry is is a lot more grounded i feel everyone's kind of on the same playing field and I yes th- I, I believe that I, 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 yeah absolutely um certainly more than something like the film industry i think when i sort yeah. of hear about um in from an audio perspective in in like film and and sort of studios where it's kind of like there's there's juniors and and assistants and things like that we don't do that at rare we just somebody like we've got uh, Chloe Kwok who's mm. up and coming composer and she's incredible and there's no there's no kind of that everybody's in it together and we you know uh, help each other out on all sorts of stuff it's not about um, which I think is sort of in the film industry you get the impression it's kind of like a composer have assistants don't really do that don't do that at all like no, we're both, com- no. we're both composers and we're both composing. And and the final product, the the thing that gets praise is the final product itself, as opposed to say with music and film, it might be certain individuals, like the musician or the actors, for example. But when people are praising a game, they're praising the actual art itself. Yeah, because it's a it's a it's a massive team effort yeah. to get it there. That's right. That's right. Yeah, and, and it's not the brings... emphasis isn't on one individual or in a, a, a few individuals. It's on the team, and that Absolutely. probably helps. I, I'd imagine and keeping everything grounded. Yeah, and it, yeah. it's just a, it's all about the sort of the team, and again, it's just that be creative and that creativity and explore and yeah, do it. Yeah. Just go play and do stuff together, and yeah, it's all about yeah. that. I think that's well, when you get the best results. Yep, I agree. I agree. Well, um, Robin, hey, thank you so much. This has been great. Thank you. Um, I appreciate you taking the time out away from the studio and bike rides and <laughs> all, all the, <laughs> the rest of the stuff r- you do. <laughs> yeah. yeah, the bike rides are, uh, yeah, for, for a while, just uh, just the odd little uh, tootle about. That's it, yeah. Nothing major. Yeah. It is important, actually. It's, it's something, it's worth saying, actually, it sort of, to the youngsters but it's i think um the fit fitness on finding something that you enjoy doing is really important in this 
in this sort of job i think and i wish i'd found i wish i'd discovered it a lot sooner because i think it really really helps with your sort of mental health and your creativity and it's so easy to go i haven't got time to do that I've, you know i need to sort of work and do this but i think it's really important to get out and do stuff do do physical exercise i think it makes a massive difference i agree i agree yeah and i wish I'd, as i say i wish i'd discovered it sooner well you're motivating yeah. me to but do nice. it now so thanks <laughs> because <laughs> i probably yeah because i probably need to do it so <laughs> being, that's it yeah being inside all the time but um yeah yeah i think it makes it i think it's it's made a massive difference to me my creativity absolutely and, it, and there was a time i'd go i haven't got time to do that i need to work on this yeah and i, I think yeah stop go out and do something yeah that's my advice good advice good advice cool all right well that's the show everyone make sure you share like and subscribe and uh, until next time stay safe